Okay, the next question comes again from Ted, and it's again very long, so we will split it in two parts. <laughs> um, it's about personality types and gender issues. Um, Tom, you're working on your book on primal man, primal woman. I've told you and sent you an unfinished draft of a paper linking the 16 personality types that you introduced us to on the board to the nature of our avatars in the physical meta reality, virtual reality, which places these personality types into our internal integrated unit of consciousness structure as digital minds. You have not told me that I was barking up the wrong tree so far. There has been recent physical meta reality research, which has shown that there is no such thing as a male or a female brain on the basis that consciousness leads and the virtual reality follows the implication is that these personality types do not vary between males and females but are rather universal the book by dr david kirsey please understand me too makes no point but this uh, makes no point of this, but there are clear indications in his book that there is no male-female component in these 16 personality types. So where is the distinction made which divides us into primal males and females? That this is not part of the 16 personality types does not mean that this division is not made in our integrated unit of, of consciousness, just that it is independent of the personality types. I am not asking you to release information before your book is finished, but can you comment on this? Well, I can I can make a few comments on it. Uh, uh, I would not agree with the, uh, he says that uh, some current research shows that there's no difference between the female and the male brain. I say that is not true. I'm not sure what that person meant by that, but there's very real differences between uh, the female and the male brain. There's differences in, in uh, average size because men are bigger, women are smaller. There's differences in the parts of the brain that are used for different functions. Uh, we see things and hear things and interpret things differently. We uh, process things differently. So there's very different. There's a lot of differences there. The person who says there's no differences, they're not talking evidently about those things. They're talking about some other aspect of the brain in which they don't find any difference but obviously there are differences that uh, functional differences that express themselves in constraints uh on the consciousness okay so uh there are fundamental differences between male and female and the way we act and where do these differences come from well they they come from um our evolution Okay, we evolved as a species to be the way we are. Uh, it was in our advantage to our survival and procreation that we specialized as we have as male and female. Uh, we do different sorts of things. We um, uh, evolved in different ways. Females are the way they are. You know, the book, uh, you know, women are from Venus, men are from Mars, and points out a lot of different ways that men and women interpret even the same words differently. Well, women are the way they are because that was the optimum way for our species to survive and procreate because anything else, we wouldn't be here, you see. So that was the optimal. There was no other choices that worked better for us than that because that's the choice that survived and you know is, is now here. And it's the same with the men. Men are the way men are because that was what the uh, was optimal, that kind of a being that we men are was an optimal choice uh, for our procreation survival as a species. That's what evolution does. The things that work go on, the things that don't work get left by the wayside, go away. So we are the way we are because that worked. That worked for you know, millions of years, many millions of years. And over those many millions of years, we, like every other creature that evolved on this planet, evolved instincts. Now, people think that humans 
are somehow different than the other animals. You know, humans are special. We don't have instincts. You know, we we don't do that. You know, animal all the other animals and critters have instincts that they act this way or that way just because that's the way their genetics are. And people aren't like that. Well, that's nonsense. We have instincts just like every other critter has instincts but we don't recognize our instincts as instincts because we believe we know and control everything we just believe that so if we suddenly have a have a uh, what a proclivity for this or that behavior react this way or that way uh, in a certain situation well we justify that because that's what we really wanted to do or that's what we need to do or we couldn't have done anything else but in the cases that have to do with fundamental issues of survival, which have to do with procreation, have to do with sex, have to do with, uh, um, you know, I guess surviving in the environment. Those are the things that are tied very closely to our instincts. And males and females are different because we have, we found in our species that it was to our advantage to survive and procreate, to specialize in various parts of, of living, okay? So only the females have babies. Only the females can breastfeed those babies. And in our millions and millions of years of evolution, they couldn't go buy, you know, uh, uh, a bottle to feed their baby. You know, the, the women and the babies were connected until the babies could get along on their own, so they grew up enough. They had babies pretty much continually until they were old enough to die of old age, which in those days was probably about 35 years old or so. It was about the lifespan of people at that time. So we evolved a relationship between male and female that took advantage of protecting the women because as you are pregnant, and lactating and have to deal with children you need some protection and you need some provisioning in order for you to do that successfully so that the race goes on and if you're going to be the protector and the provisioner as the men were then you need a little extra strength a little extra size you need to be more focused on the outside world and you just grow to be a little different person you process the world a little differently in either case so male and females are just fundamentally different because evolution has made them that way because specializing rather than both being the same was more effective to our survival and procreation than both being the same. In fact, I have read something recently and it's probably uh, like all of these things where they talk about the way people were, you know, six million years ago, it's kind of hard to do that precisely. We don't have that kind of precise information. But the idea was that the reason that the other, uh, should we call them, uh, you know, the other humanoids, not homo sapiens, but uh, others that uh, did uh, walk the earth, they didn't make it, okay? They became extinct. And part of the reason that they didn't make it, at least the one species, let's see, what am I thinking of? Um, all right, what's the closest relative we have? Help my uh, old man imagine it, uh, old man uh, brain here. What's the closest species to us that didn't make it? Uh, Neanderthal. Neanderthal, yeah, Neanderthal, man. For some reason, that word just left my old brain. Anyway, Neanderthal, they're thinking that the reason they th didn't make it was they seemed to be both about the same size, and, and uh, there, there really wasn't much differentiation between the male and female. So that was more of an idea that everybody did everything. So when it came, you know, to whatever the tasks were and the, necess the necessities of life and procreation and survival and the rest of it, everybody did everything because everybody was about as fit to do everything as everybody else. And that then was not specialized. It was very egalitarian, but it wasn't specialized. And it was for that very reason that Homo sapien went forward and Neanderthal did not because they did not specialize and therefore they didn't have the advantage that specialization can bring to a team that works together. So anyway, that uh, that's something I read probably a, a year or so ago that was a was a, uh, an idea 
of why Homo sapiens continued on and Neanderthal reached a dead end for that, uh, for that species. So in any way, there are differences. We have instincts and those differences are instinctual. And they're also coded in our, in our genetics because we're not only specialized in the way we think, we're specialized physically as well. So there is big differences between male and female. And anybody who writes a book saying that there really aren't any differences, that the brains are the same, and you know, the only differences between men and women is the, you know, is their uh, reproduction parts. Other than that, they're just exactly the same. That's nonsense. We are different through and through to the core as uh, as individuals. So that uh, kind of throws a monkey wrench in what Ted was asking there because it kind of uh, denies that. And he talks about the 16 personality types. Well, now that may or may not have anything to do with male and female. As I've said, the male and female um, differentiation came basically around the issues of reproduction and survival. Okay, that's the stuff that, uh, that's where our instincts come into play. You know, we don't have instincts about whether we should wear a red shirt or a green shirt or whether we should, uh, you know, drive a car or walk. That's not where our instincts come to play. Our instincts come to play in things about survival and procreation. So now these 16 personality types, you know, you, you know of some of them, uh, some personality type uh, things called Myers-Briggs. Everybody's probably heard of those. Well, I don't know that that's 16, but that's some, some subset of that. That's a, what they've done is they've, they've created these personality types and then they are able to, um, shall we say, sort all the different people in the world into one of these 16 types. So they can say, we can make 16 general categories and everybody fits into one of these categories more than they fit into another. And that's probably not true. That's probably theory, but I suspect that there are those people that land on the boundary between types. It's just that they're probably a minority. And this idea about it, uh, you know, that everybody is a particular type is probably not actually true. There's probably some people are combinations of types or between types or maybe even between two or three different types. But most of us evidently do fit because these things like Myers-Briggs become very popular. And the reason they become very popular is because they work. You know, you can you can look at, uh, you can give people tests and define, you know, what these types are and what their personality type is. And then you can read all sorts of characteristics of that type and it tends to fit them like a glove. Yes, indeed, that is the way they approach life. And yeah, they do make decisions like that. And so it, it works, that's why it's popular and that's why it's used and business uses it a lot so that they can, uh, be more productive in their team making if they understand how these various personality types work. So rather than struggle, they can work together knowing the proclivities and the, and the idiosyncrasies of all the various types. So it's a, it's a very valuable thing. And uh, Ted and I have talked about this a little, and the idea is that these personality types may be fundamental, and there's 16, there, there's several other groups besides Breyer, uh, Myers and Briggs that have come to these types. And then other people have taken these from the various groupings from other people and combined them into still other groupings. So there's there's lots of, of these around. And uh, Ted knows more about than I do. He has studied some of these. So we take these types and the idea is that perhaps that um, these types are fundamental at the larger consciousness system level. You know, that they are, uh, that uh, individuated units of consciousness are made in such a way that they fall out into these types. Now that's like a chicken and an egg problem. Is it because they're fundamental to the consciousness system that they fall out that way, or are they that way? And we can just sort people into these 16 general types. Um, uh, you know, it could work either, it could work in either direction as far as cause and effect, which is the cause and which is the effect is not real hard, or it's not real easy to tell sometimes. But anyway, there may be some connection between these discrete personality types and the way that individuated units of consciousness are created. And the, the, uh, 
fact that you get some repetition in that creation. That it's not that it's a complete, uh, you know, it's a complete random draw that you have seven and a half billion people and every one of them is completely dissimilar from every other one. That's kind of hard to imagine. You know, we do have similarities and it's these similarities that allow us to be broken into, into types. So is that uh, generated by cause at the uh, consciousness level, or is that rather an effect of the fact that all of these people interacting, having similar experiences and uh, so on, end up having similar, you know, similar types. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the thought, but I'm not exactly sure what Ted was, uh, I can look at his question uh, a little bit. I'm not quite sure exactly what his question is, but, uh, uh, let's see. So where is the distinction made which divides into primal males and females? Well, I say that's the distinction that comes from our basic evolution. And it is also captured in our DNA that uh, we have many instincts that make us act and be in the way that we are. That is quite different between males and females. And all of those things in our DNA are like that because that's what succeeded in the evolutionary game. Uh, okay, so we then I guess go on to a part two. Okay, part two of Ted's question. There has been information on the board, and my understanding is that there can be problems when individuated units of consciousness, when an individual unit of consciousness incarnates consistently as one gender, and then suddenly incarnates as the other gender. Personally, I have speculated that this might be the origin of the whole range of both male and female homosexuality and also transgender problems. That these quote unquote problems are entirely natural and arise because we, as individual units of consciousness, incarnate for extended periods as one gender and then the other, and then have to start making the evening up of our incarnation genders in order to mature further. There is also information to the effect that to mature to higher levels, these imbalances within our individual units of consciousness must be evened out, even uh, must be evened out by evening out our incarnations between male and female avatars. This has been my understanding. I further think that it would be advisable on the part of our guidance when incarnating to encourage consistently maintaining a balance between incarnations as male and females in order to avoid creating these quote unquote problems within our avatars. Of course, perhaps the creation of this kind of problem might be desirable to manage in terms of maintaining some of the continuing intensities of physical materiality incarnations. Would you please consider clarifying the whole situation? Okay, there are uh, several different uh, things that I, I guess uh, determine the, in its first part of this question, that determine uh, uh, whether uh, in your incarnation is male or female. One, you have free will, you get to choose. Two, there are certain types of experience that are more easier to get as a female or as a male. Uh, experiences that uh, require you to, to grow in different ways. Okay, so then there would be this idea that, as Ted mentions, that you need to do both. You need to incarnate as female sometimes and as male sometimes because both have different perspectives. They see the world differently, and therefore they end up with different kinds, different sets of choices seen from different uh, perspectives. And the more perspectives you have, the better your, uh, your whole growth is will be just like the if you never travel if you always stay in the same town you were born in then you become very provincial if you get out and have a lot of different perspectives and see a lot of different things you tend to be uh you, you live in a bigger picture you tend to be uh, more uh, understanding of differences so it's good to ex experience as much diversity as possible because that gives you more breadth to your experience and therefore it's, it's more valuable. So 
yes, we do do both. But the idea that, uh, say, uh, uh, homosexuality, as he mentions, or uh, you know, other uh, variations on sexual on gender and, and sexuality. Yes, there can be some influence, as Ted says, maybe because you switch from one gender to another, as far as your incarnation goes, that may switch you from seeing things one way for a long time and suddenly having to see them another way, and that's a bit of a shock, so it uh, kind of puts you in between. But that's not, that's an influence perhaps, but that's not the main thing. The main thing going on uh, with the uh, different expressions that we have of sexuality uh, is that there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of chance in this making of avatars, right? In our rule set, our rule set takes a sperm and an egg and then creates another human being out of those two. And there's lots of probability that goes into that. There's billions of ways that that sperm and that egg can interact with the various genes that it has and the chromosomes and what gets turned on and turned off and how things get expressed. That's why we like snowflakes all are different. We don't look the same. We don't act the same. We're not the same because there's all of this possible variation. There's a huge amount of uncertainty about how a human beings going to turn out exactly what they're going to look like, be like, and so on, how they're going to be structured, how they're going to uh, uh, end up. It's a, a lot of, uh, what should I say, probability and statistics in that. Lots and lots of possibilities, and only one of those is going to come out of those billions of possibilities. So when you have that much uncertainty, what happens is that you get a statistical variation over the possibilities. Right, so you can think of this big. Uh, you know, I try to draw it with my finger. I get my finger up here to the camera can see it. You have this big curve that's kind of flat here on the bottom. That's called the tail. Then it goes up and gets big, and then it comes back down and gets flat. The tail. That's a normal statistical distribution. If you have things that just occur randomly, they tend to be in normal distributions like that. Well, okay. So in that big fat part of the curve, that's where most of us live. Okay, that's the big majority is under the fat part of the curve. Now, there are tails to that curve. That's where the things that are unusual happen, but they still happen, you see? Everything, even though there's, there's a billion ways that, that the genes and the, and the chromosomes and the DNA can, from an egg and a sperm can produce a human being, there's billions of ways it only comes out one way and that way can fall anywhere under that curve most of the time it falls in the fat part under the middle where most of us are but sometimes it falls out under either end and sometimes just a little bit out and sometimes far out in mathematics we we, we call that distance out under the curves in terms of standard deviations so we say it's a you know you're a, a three sigma person okay and that means that you have three standard deviations away from the median so you're a little further out on that curve. Or you're a 10 sigma person. That means you're 10 standard deviations. That means you're way out under the tail. And these have meanings and probability. We don't need to go into all that. But everything that can happen generally does happen at least some of the time. So the stuff that's a 10 sigma possibility, that means it only happens you know, once in I don't know. I'd have to go back, look at my uh, books to see what one and you know what ten sigma is. But let's say it happens one in a million times, just once in a million, maybe once in ten million. So it's way out there. That still happens. We got seven and a half billion people, so some of those one in a million, you know, turns out now to be thousands and thousands of people. And the sort of the stuff that's just one in a hundred is a whole lot, you know, lots of people. So, you know, millions and millions of people get the one in a hundred. So because of all the ways this comes out, we have all sorts of kinds of people, short people, tall people, you know, uh, smart people, not so smart people. We've got lots of variation and we get that same kind of variation in our sexual attitudes and in our, um, we say, uh, sexual identities and our sexual proclivities in the way we see the world 
and what turns us on and turns us off. There's all of these combinations. So a lot of that is simply biological. It's just the, the tails under the curve of all the possibilities. Some of the possibilities come out different than what's under the main part of the curve. And that's what most of these uh, differences are. Now, besides that, that's the genetic, that's the biological contribution. Besides that, there's a, there's a social or a psychological contribution. And that would have to do with our experiences, things that push us one way or another in our experiences to become more like this or identify more with that. So there's that too. And then as Ted says, there may be some of, of our incarnational influences. If we have a lot of incarnations as a man and then decide, oh, we're kind of unbalanced here. We need to get more balanced and see the female side of things. So now we decide to incarnate as a female and we have a little struggle trying to get our head wrapped around that because it's so different than what we were doing. So maybe then we act a little strange. We don't act like most of the women. We kind of act sort of like a manly woman because we're kind of manly in our, in our viewpoint as consciousness because that's all we've done. So maybe that's part of it too. So we have the environmental, the, you know, the social, the social, and perhaps the reincarnational. But I think the big thing driving most of it is the biological. It's just all of the possibilities, all the ways that biochemistry can come out that are not under the fat part of the curve, uh, and all the ways that the social things can bounce us around that are not part of the, don't leave us under the fat part of the curve. That's where these differences come from. So they're just differences. We're all just different. And these differences should be celebrated. These differences should be uh, accepted and what they're normal differences. You know, that's the way it is. You get a curve, you always have tails up, you know, under that curve. You don't have all the people aren't cookie cutter. They all, all come out being exactly like each other. You know, they come out very different. And because there's such a widespread of uncertainty, there's a very widespread of differences in the biology. The, bi the rule set that develops the biology is very complicated. And very little different things at different times can make the biochemistry turn out differently. It's not, a, it's not something that you can, you know, it just turns out the way it turns out. It's very uncertain. So that's the way I, you know, that's I, the way I see the, all the differences in our, in our, not only our looks and our appearance and whether we have good eyes or bad eyes or tall or short or all the rest of the things we inherit, but we inherit all that biochemistry, all our inclinations. We also inherit all our instincts, all the ways that we act that are male, all the ways we act that are female and all the variations they are in male and female. So the variations of how do males act and all the variation of how do females act, well, of course they overlap. You know, they, they're not all, you know, run out to, to opposite poles. They all, these tails of the curve, here's the, here's the curve that goes up and goes down for all the characteristics of male. And here's the curve goes up and goes down for all the characteristics of female. And those curves have parts of them that overlap where it's just, you know, male could be that way, female could be that way. So that's all. We have statistics there. So that's, let's see, let me go back and look at this question and see if I can see if I've answered it all. Um, so these, uh, he says, that, let's see, uh, so I don't know, I guess I've clarified, I guess he's answered most of his questions um, uh, that I have. Maybe I've clarified it some, but, um, you know, the, I guess it, it doesn't really make too much difference where you end up on this probability curve. Whether you come out under the middle, whether you come out on one extreme or the other, really doesn't make any difference. That's not important. What's important is what do you do with what you've got? If you happen to be born and you come out way on the extreme, let's say physically, so you have no arms, that's an extreme. Not a whole lot of people are born with no arms, but obviously it's possible and it does happen. And if that's your fate that that's the way you are well it's not that important that that's the way you are what's important is what do you make of it what are you going to do with it how do you deal with it you see so that's what's important so however you come out 
uh, sexually on these curves, whether you're out at the 10 sigma or one sigma or dead center in the middle or whatever, is just not important at all. It's how do you, you know, what do you do with it? You're given certain capabilities and inclinations and instincts and all the rest of it. Now you get to make choices about those and what choices are you going to make? How are you going to feel about it? You're going to feel, you know, what? And then you have all the social things. You know, we have, we have social issues because people don't just see all these as differences. All equal, but just different. And we don't celebrate differences. Differences frighten us. We are herd animals. Well, actually, I should say we're social animals. I just say we're herd animals because people understand that. You know, we, we tend to, to uh, be frightened by anything that's different. Anything in the herd that uh, is unusual, you know, you get a cow in a herd and instead of the cow being brown with white spots, it's green with purple spots. All the other cows will stay away from it like it's different. It's scary. We don't know what's wrong with it. Maybe it's a disease. We just tend to do that. Anybody that's different than us frightens us, makes us fearful. So that's just a characteristic of herd animals. We tend to go with the herd and we don't like things that are different. We like things that conform. That creates problems for people who happen to be on the tails of the curves. Well, then that's another thing they have to deal with. How are you going to deal with it? You see, can you make can you make choices there that help you evolve, or can you make choices that don't? So we all have our own unique places for making choices. We all have our own things to deal with, and what they are isn't that important you know black white homosexual heterosexual tall short all of those things don't matter as what matters is how do you deal with it you have special opportunities to deal with things if you have any of those unusual conditions if you're short if you're a guy and you're only four feet eleven that gives you a whole different set of choices to deal with than if you were six foot six. Completely different set of choices, how you deal with it. You see, so there's opportunities there of being four foot 11 that you don't get when you're six foot six. And there may be things you may need to learn from that. You see, both have different sets of opportunities. So there's value in both. There's choices. And typically the tougher the choice, the more opportunity there is to learn. If your choices are, are easy, if you don't have things that stress you, if you don't have things that make you have to deal with things that are tough to deal with, you generally don't grow as much. The things that are tougher is where a lot of the learning is, the things you have to struggle with. So I look at these differences of the people that end up out on the, on the uh, uh, tails of the curve, that they're unusual some way that gives them a unique set of opportunities that other people don't have so maybe these are old souls that are looking for tougher problems or maybe it's just the luck of the draw and it's probably some of both but anyway that's uh you know differences are all One's everything's, you know, it's not like some are better than others. You know, people with two arms aren't necessarily better than people with no arms. It's just different. And differences are all good because they all come with good choices. How to, how to deal with whatever it is you got. Well, I don't know, Ted, uh, I probably didn't answer your question, but uh, that's, you know, the, the gender issue is one of great diversity. And there are these major differences between male and female that are encased in our genetic structure. And within those differences, there are huge variabilities. And all of the variabilities are all natural. They're all okay. They're all just the way the cookie happened to crumble when all of those very uh, delicate uh, rule set biology things were forming. Uh, and uh, we should celebrate all of them. And uh, it's not a matter of, uh, 
you know, that everybody's, everybody's the same. We don't want to all be cookie cutter. Just think what a boring place it would be. If every, every one of us looked exactly like every other, we'd have a hard time knowing who was our mother and who was our sister, you know, that everybody would look alike. And that wouldn't be much fun. We get a lot more choices with diversity. Diversity creates choices. As you get rid of diversity, your choices go away. The less diversity you have, the fewer choices that we have. So diversity is a good thing. It's a good thing for all of us. And it offers all of us opportunities, no matter where we are on that curve, out under the tails or in the middle. It's all natural. It's all good. It's all opportunity. Okay. So the next question comes from Ryan. He has been waiting patiently. So Ryan, go ahead and ask your question on synchronicity. Uh, you are still muted. Sorry. You have to unmute yourself. No. We don't hear you. You are unmuted, but we don't hear you. Well, I guess I'll have to ask your question also. <laughs> just, just read his question, I guess. Yep. Uh, as someone who experiences recurring synchronicity, which awoke me to up to a bigger picture, but seems to get a set of numbers um, repeating over and over, I am am I creating those uh, with my intent, or are these the larger consciousness system still nudging me? I sometimes wonder whether I draw in the numbers or they are being presented to me. Again, there's multiple answers to the question, multiple possibilities, but just a sequence of numbers, I would doubt that you're making those up. That seems like kind of an odd thing to make up. There's not a lot of metaphors that you could come up with in a, in a series of numbers. I suspect you're getting that from the larger consciousness system. It's what you're being given. Now, why would the larger consciousness system give you a series of numbers? Well, there's a couple of reasons why that, that uh, might be the case. One, it could just be a, a lesson in paying attention to messages you get from the larger consciousness system. And uh, I had early on, years, decades ago, uh, in my own evolution, I got things from the larger consciousness system that were relatively meaningless, meaningless things, things that I would get a nudge to do or not. And it, not, it wasn't the thing itself that was important, but it was just a, uh, a lesson, if you would, in paying attention. Do you get the message? And will you, do you operate on the message? You see, you're, you're, if you don't get the message or if you don't operate on it, you go, okay, I'm walking up to a door and suddenly I get the urge that I need to open the door with my left hand instead of my right hand. Well, that's kind of bizarre, right? What difference does it make? But I get that urge. Now I can do a couple of things about that urge. I can say, well, okay, I'll just follow that intuition. I'll open it with my left hand. And of course, nothing happens. It just it doesn't make any difference. And uh, it's just a way of the system training me to pay attention to what I'm getting and act on it. Because someday the system's gonna say, duck. And I need to immediately duck or I'm gonna run into a problem. You see, and if I hear the system say duck, and I say duck, duck what? Where's a duck? You see, and I don't operate on it. I say, oh, that's nonsense. What do you mean duck? And then I get hit in the back of the head with a baseball or something. You see, I have, I'm not paying attention. So now the system can't really work with me. It, it's limited in what it can do because I'm not responsive to its nudges. So if it's important for me to learn to interact with these subtleties to where I get it and I can act on it, then it just was, it, it just was uh, nonsensical things, but it was training. So that may be one reason why you're getting this. It's, it's not that the one that the numbers necessarily mean anything. It may just be training. Okay, here's the numbers, get it? And you go, okay, I got it, I'm paying attention. And that may be all there is to it. Okay, you got it. And uh, now they give them to you again and again. Well, maybe every time your job is to say, yep, got it. Same numbers. And you're learning something. And that could be, you know, it could be just as simple as that. 
Now, it could be that these numbers are going to mean something to you. It could be that these numbers are a setup for you to one day, they'll plug into something very important. And um, when they do, you'll go, ah, that's what those numbers were. Okay. And then it's one of those things like Ingeborg seeing, you know, the, the uh, building, the, the theater that she had seen. And then there's an aha moment. And then suddenly now you can tell these numbers really came from something in the know because here's the connection. All right. You have, you get three numbers and that's the, let's say it's, you know, this, this, and that, and you have three children, and all of them are born on that day. One of them is born in the one number, the next one's born in the next number, and the third one's born in the next number. And you go, wow, what a coincidence. And then you put that together and say, well, I don't know why that happened, but, you know, I got all those birthdays, you know, when I was, you know, 10 years ago, before I was even married and was thinking about children, I got that. Or, you know, some way, the numbers may become significant later just to show you that, Reality is a lot, you know, deeper and broader than you thought, and there are connections that can be made to future events, and that's just uh, one of those things that will put your head spinning and, and make you aware that mm, it's a lot bigger and a lot more complicated than I thought. So it could be one of those, or it might not be one of those. So there's several reasons, why, you know, why you might be getting those particular numbers. There may be something special about them that you just haven't found yet or they may just be helping you learn how to pay attention to your intuition, to messages from the non-physical. And in which case, uh, once you get aware of it, they'll probably change it up into all sorts of other things too, just to see if you uh, will get it. And I found that kind of a fun game. You know, and I think sometimes I would miss it, but it typically was a fun game and it wasn't anything that would ever embarrass you. It's not like, all right, my, you know, my intuition says I should jump up on the table and, and dance, you know, well, and you're in a meet, you're in a business meeting, you know, and you say, I don't think so. That's not too smart. So it also could give you that kind of an intuition just to keep you thinking for yourself. So you don't become a slave to your intuition. You see, so it may give you something that's silly like that. And what you're supposed to do is say, no, I reject that. And the one that says, open the door with your left hand, you go, okay, I'll do that. So now you are learning to take this information, judge its acceptability, uh, differentiate between the things that look that seem reasonable and the things that don't, and act on them. Well, those are good things to learn. I've been through training courses like that just to, you know, make it easier to, to deal with things. So now as you, as you get better and better at it, then you, you don't just do trivial things like doorknobs or numbers, you know, it gets to be about people and interactions and what's happening next and that kind of thing. So it's a, I'm guessing that's what it is. You're just in a little training course about uh, picking up things and, and uh, accepting them, not accepting them, judging, acting and you get i got some that would be not only would i do it but would i follow their intuition but how quickly would i follow how much lead time did they need and that's like the duck thing you know if they do something and you need to respond immediately as opposed to think about it and do it the next day and pretty soon you can get a sense of that intuition and what you can do with it and what you can't do with it but you don't ever want to become a slave to it. You don't want to have this thing that, oh, you know, my intuition says I need to do this thing, so I have to do it. You still have free will. You're still responsible for all your choices, and you still have to make all those choices. You can't follow it just because, you know, you can't be one of these things that say, oh, I walked into the restaurant and shot all those people because God told me to do it. You know, you uh, that's not a good excuse. You know, you have to... Uh, Think for yourself all along. And if you get too much to where you're obedient, they will give you things that aren't helpful for you to do just to show you that you have to take responsibility to sort on what you do and what you don't do. That it's always your choice. No, nothing else can take your free will. But you can get used to it. Ah, the extra information is really kind of nice because now I can use my free will. But instead of just getting 
you know, two strings of information. Now I've got 10 different pieces of information that weigh on that choice and I learned to trust it. Now I can make better choices because I have more information. A little bit of it's normal and the rest of it's paranormal, but it makes it easier for you to make situations where you can't just go from never having done that to doing that. You have to kind of learn how to, how to do that in steps. And that's probably what it's about. Often we get strange things that happen to us and we have no idea what's that from. You know, am I just making this up or is that coming from something else? Or what is this with these numbers? And the best thing to do is just go with it, interact with it and see what happens. Again, you have to live gracefully with uncertainty. If you really have this burning, I need to know what is it with these numbers? You know, and it, that's a big thing for you having to know that it'll get in the way with your actually learning anything from it. So you just live gracefully with uncertainty. You learn what you can learn and uh, you get what you can get out of it and then you let it go. It's not a, it's not something that drives your life. It's just another data stream and you learn how to use it or how to ignore it. Okay. Um, just a quick remark since we were talking about the larger consciousness system giving numbers. Um, two weeks ago, I thought about playing the lottery. And when you play the lottery here, at least the system I was trying, it gives you like when you open it up, it gives you a number like the, the, the preset. And that preset was exactly my phone number, except for one digit. One digit was wrong. It was a, a nine where there should be a zero. So I said, well, if I get that number and it's almost my phone number, I'm just going to judge that one digit and then I'm going to play it and just see what happens. And thing is, I didn't win anything. But the number which was there when I opened it up, that number won. And it didn't only won once, it won twice. So I would have won twice if I just played the number that I got. But I had to use my intellect to say, well, that's my phone number, except for this one digit. I'm going to change that one. And that meant I lost. So <laughs> take the number the larger consciousness system gives you and don't use your intellect. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good lesson to learn. <laughs> right. So my uh, actually my my question is also about numbers and uh, it's about uh, do numbers have a deeper meaning? Several authors of metaphysical and spiritual theories often see great significance in specific numbers. Do you see any connection between specific aspects of consciousness or reality and a particular number? And is the search for the meaning of numbers useful from your point of view? I don't know. You know. I, I am very uh, um, careful about not saying that things don't have significance or meaning that I really have not studied. So I, I haven't studied that enough. I don't know of any particular significance that I can attribute to just a given number. Now, sets of numbers or strings of numbers can have all kinds of significance if you have a, if you create a tool that uses them. All right, let me, here's what I'm thinking about. If you have, you've heard of the old uh, um, uh, way of defining the future was to take a handful of chicken bones and you throw the chicken bones out on the floor and how the bones land, if you know how to read chicken bones, will tell you what's going to happen in the future. That was a, you know, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it is look at the tea leaves swirling around in a, in a, you know, in a cup of tea and these are things that have some pattern to them. The bones have a pattern and the tea leaves will have a pattern. And the pattern has a lot to do with randomness. The pattern can be different kinds of patterns, either the bones or the tea leaves. And if you make a, a tool with those, such that every time that the chicken bones lie like this, it's gonna mean that. And every time the tea leaves bunch up this way, that's going to be, you know, that can be interpreted this way. So if I make up a, a tool set and attribute certain meanings to certain patterns, well, the larger consciousness system can use that medium to connect with me. You see, it can, it can use that as, a, as, a, as an output medium, how the tea leaves fall out. Now, how, why can it use that? Well, it can use that because it's very random. When you stir up a bunch of tea and see how it sits, it could go in any kind of way. So that's something that the larger conscious system can 
manipulate and nobody knows any manipulations going on because it's just a random process. Same with the chicken bones, you throw them in the air. How they land could be manipulated, but it'd be impossible to tell because there's so much uncertainty with how they land that however it is, is just however it is. So now you could have things with numbers, with patterns of numbers, with where you find numbers. If I find certain patterns and numbers in certain ways or certain places or in telephone numbers or in birthdays or this or that, it means this, it means that. So if I come up with a set of meanings that I can attach to certain ways that I find numbers, then I could see that it might be used, that it might have some uh, uh, usefulness as a tool. Now I'm saying this out of complete ignorance of what's called, I guess, numerology, which is the, what I think what you're talking about is called numerology and it gives specific uh, metaphysical meanings to numbers and sequences of numbers and so on. But the chicken bones and the tea leaves really work two ways. Not only does it allow the larger conscious system a format for communicating to you, it also allows you a way for um getting information okay because your mind is focused on what you get in the you know what you use your mind to go to the let's say future probable database and get information about the future you do that but because you don't believe that that's really possible and you don't know anything about these databases and that just lies outside of your possibility then instead you throw the chicken bones or look at the tea leaves. You get that same information, but the output format is in the is in the array. It's the way the bones land. So it's 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 kind of a, a game. It's a way. It's like a Ouija board. It's a it's a setup that allows you to connect with the larger conscious system with those databases, and the tool gives you a method for doing that. Some kind of schema for getting information out of those databases. Uh, what else can you do? You can drop, uh, you can hold a bunch of reads and drop them and count them in groups. And it's, it's the what the I, the I Ching. You can tell your fortune, or you can go get a get a message or advice from the I Ching by doing a similar kind of thing, by letting chance pick the what they call hexagram that you uh, that you interpret in the I Ching. That's just a tool that the more people that use it the more the deeper that groove for using that tool becomes and the more it's a you know it's a it's a way that uh, people can can communicate so i don't know anything about numerology so what i probably just said is probably has all the numerologists in the world you know screaming and pulling their hair because that has nothing at all to do i'm sure with what they think they're doing but that is my since i know nothing about numerology that's the only way that i can think of that patterns of numbers might have some meaning, you know, some quote unquote meaning other than other than numbers at certain groups. If it's patterns they're looking at, patterns of numbers, just like patterns of bones or patterns of tea leaves or patterns of the of the celestial bodies, you know, relative to your birthday. Any of these patterns can be developed into tools for prognostication or for I don't know, divining other kinds of information. It's, um, you know, you have uh, diviners looking for uh, water. You know, come out, you want a well drilled, guy will come out with a little handle with a wire sticking out of it, and he'll walk around on your property, and he's a dowser. And when the wire bends down, he says, ah, here's where the water is. Or it used to be a fork. You hold on to a, a branch that was too, you know, a fork, like a Y. And he'd hold on to the two legs of the Y and let the little point stick out. And then it would turn down when he got over water. Well, of course, scientists would say, oh, that's absolute nonsense. But if you have a well drill, I don't know about your culture, but I know in mine, if I call somebody out here to drill my well, there will be a man. And he won't have a little stick with, with a Y. But he'll have a he'll have a handle with a wire sticking out, and he will walk around, and that's how he'll decide where to drill. And why does he do that? Because it works. That's why he does that. Because if he just goes out and says, "Well, let's look at the geology and let's look at this and that," and he tries to do it intellectually, 
it's a hit or miss. When he uses his little coat hanger or whatever he's got there, you know, he gets hits. So he does it because it works. How does it work? It's just a tool. He's getting data from a database. And that's the tool that he uses to get that data. Same way a Ouija board works. You know, these things work because they're, they are uh, tool sets that are subtle. Uh, nobody sees, nobody actually sees this coat hanger go, you know, like a big fish is on the other end. You know, it's, it's nothing that you can see. It's something you feel and it's subtle. Well, subtle feelings have a lot of uncertainty around them and subtle feelings can, uh, you know, be generated uh, very easily because of all the uncertainty about the subtle feelings. So that's the same way with the Ouija. You know, you, your hand goes around as a little Ouija thing. Well, your muscles were moving your hand side to side. You know, it, your hand wobbles a little bit. It doesn't take a whole lot to move it one way or another like that. And because you're kind of on that balance point that it's just as easy to go one way or another and you get these little subtle things and you know, your hand just seems to go around this Ouija board. Well, that's another one of those things where there's lots of uncertainty and it's easy to manipulate. So most of the progn prognostication systems have to do with patterns that have a lot of randomness in it. And then you interpret the pattern. And inside of that interpretation is where the connection to the larger consciousness system comes in and you actually get download of data that verifies that, that interpretation. And the interpretations themselves often have lots of uncertainty in them. Oh, if the chicken bone lies like this, it means this, unless there's another bone over here pointing that way, then it means that. And of course, if there's two other bones sitting over here at the same time, then that whole set means something else, which means there's a whole lot of ways to interpret it, you see. And when you get that connection to the larger conscious system and you get a download, well, that kind of guides how you put together all the connections that you're going to make and you come out with a story. And as far as you know, you know, it's the bones that told you the future, or the tea leaves or the stars, or not the stars, but the planets. There's a lot of variation in how you put those things together. And if you practice enough, you can get good at using those tools and they actually work. But if the tool doesn't have any power or magic in it, it's the intent and the larger consciousness system. The database is where all the information is coming from. The tool is just a way that helps you express that. So that's the only thing I can think of that would make numbers have some kind of uh, metaphysical you know, magic ability. Um, now, I ha again, I'm sorry to all the numerologists out there. It's probably blasphemy, uh, uh, and uh, they won't like that. Uh, I know I've, I've mentioned this to some astronom uh, astrologers, and they don't particularly care for it either, in my interpretation. But uh, I had a few of them that do do agree with it. You know, one of the ways that you can that you can kind of see that it, that uh, that interpretation makes sense, at least with astrology, is that computers can compute astrological positions far better and far more accurately than can people with pencils and paper. So if it was the exact positions of stars and moons and planets and things, and if there were precise interpretations of those positions, then the very best, the very most accurate astrologers would all be computers because they could compute everything more accurately and faster than anybody if it were just a logical system. And they do have computers that do horoscopes, but they're all very mediocre. The computers aren't the stars. They're not the ones that really, uh, you know, get reputations. The people who get reputations are the people who have a connection with the databases and they're getting information with the database and they're using their astrology as a tool to help them do that. It's a, it's a construct that allows them to interpret that information and get that information down. It's a way of doing it. So that's, so if, if it really was just a logical thing, the planets are where the planets are and the moons are where the moons are and the interpretations are just like this, then computers would be better than anybody because they could do it you know, 15 decimal places, people only the two or three. But computers aren't very good astrologers. So 
any case, uh, so that's my that's the only thing I can think, Oliver, that the numbers and patterns might be used in that way to mean something. Something kind of random like bumps on your head. You know, that's another numerology thing. You get all the bumps on your head and it'll tell you something uh, about uh, your personality or who you are, or your future or something. I'm not sure what it tells you, but it's supposed to tell you something accurate. And the people who do that are using that as a tool. But the I think the real information doesn't come from the bumps on your head. It comes from the database and they don't know it. They're not intentionally getting data from a database but that's what they've learned to do. And almost always people that do these things have to do them in a certain mental state. You talk to an astrologer, he doesn't do his astrology while he's cooking dinner and having a conversation. He can't do it then. He has to be quiet. He has to have a, a focus. He has to make a connection. And then he gets the information. Same with the tea leaves and the chicken bones. The lady who does the tea leaves has to get into a kind of a mental state as to get into the right mood, the right connection, and then it works. If she's not in that right connection, it doesn't work. Same with the chicken bones and, and the rest of it. So it tends to have a, it's important in the way the mindset and the attitude of the person doing it is, is an important part of all of those things. And that's because that's really the, how you make the connection. You have to get into that state where you get the data. Why it's like that. So sorry to all you people who I've just blasphemed your your belief systems, and I may be totally wrong about numbers because I don't know about them. But that's my only thoughts on it. Okay, thank you, Tom. And we have reached the final question that comes again from the forum and is on fear. Um, it's actually very short. Is it possible for a free will, that for a free will awareness unit to have more fear? than the individuated unit of consciousness it is a part of. And there's a short explanation. I've experienced a huge removal of ego in myself over the last few months. Unless my individuated unit of consciousness is changing rapidly or I'm undergoing a second puberty, I would, most, uh, I would almost think that my free will awareness unit is doing some catching up to my individuated units of consciousness. So much so much that I have to act like the old me in front of friends and relatives, but I feel more like myself than before. So the question again, is it possible for a free will awareness unit to have more fear than the individual unit of consciousness it is a part of? And now that question, I think there's really a couple of questions in there. Uh, of course, you come with a you come with a certain amount of of uh, quality when you go from an individuated unit of consciousness to a free will awareness unit. Okay, you come with that free will awareness unit carries the quality of the individuated unit of consciousness. So th it doesn't have more fear than its parent because it has just the same as what the parent has as far as quality. Now it gets birthed and it has experience. It can make poor decisions and increase its fear and de evolve. And in that way, an individual can have more fear than its uh, than its uh, in its uh, individuated unit of consciousness. So, a free will awareness unit can de evolve, but that's the only way that a free will awareness unit is going to have more fear than the parent individuated unit of consciousness. Is that if it de evolves and therefore gains more fear? He's talking about something else. His experience was that suddenly he had some breakthroughs. He lost a lot of fear. He dropped a bunch of ego. He's a different person now. And he says he has to kind of pretend to be the old person, you know, in front of family because that's who they expect. Well, that does sometimes happen suddenly. Sometimes a lot of data you collect, a lot of lessons kind of all remain, uh, you know, kind of held up in the air, if you will. They're kind of up there, but they haven't all coalesced. You haven't actually pulled it all together into an aha moment. But some little thread, some little last straw will happen, and suddenly all the pieces connect. And when they do, that can be a very sudden experience. Suddenly you can, lots of things click into place, and you feel like you've got so much less 
fear and ego and oh i see this now oh, now i can look back and see why i was like that why i really was self-centered and this and that and it all happens in a, in a very short period of time well that doesn't mean that your that your free will awareness unit somehow got a great bunch of fear and then and then lost it it just means that you've made progress and it all just came together suddenly rather than a little bit at a time it's more common for it to all to come together a little bit at a time. So you really don't notice the, the great aha moment that changes your life. That's less common, but it does happen. It's that, uh, it's that consciousness doing that integration work where it looks at all the data and looks at all the data. And then one day it sees all the connections and all the data makes sense. And bingo, you've got a big change in your life and it happens suddenly. Rare, but not that rare. So I think that's all. He's just grown up, grown up quickly, and so quickly that it's even startling. And uh, he doesn't feel comfortable being the new him, you know, in front of old acquaintances because they'd wonder what was wrong with him. Then he'd have a lot of explaining to do. And he's not really so sure at this point that he could explain it. So he just doesn't want to go there. And it's that sort of uh, thing. But it'll all settle out in time and it will uh, become just the way he is and everybody will accept it and yeah, it'll all work itself out not to not to worry just uh, keep being yourself and uh, keep up the keep up that good work because typically when you start changing it works as a is like an avalanche it starts small and then gets bigger and bigger and bigger and grows and you got to ride that now I'm going to change my metaphor from an avalanche to a, to a surfing wave. You got to ride that wave all the way into the beach. You got to stay with it, stay present, stay focused, and learn everything that you can learn until the whole thing, until that wave dissipates, until you get to the bottom of that avalanche. I guess you just have to stay focused with it. So I would give my advice to him would be uh, way to go, stick with it. You know, you probably have more learning that's going to fall into place yet and let it go stay focused until you've melted every bit of learning that you can out of the out of the situation so now's not the time to hide it now's the time to explore it and see if it doesn't take you other places